long day, I got a lot to say. It feels like I'm carrying a two-ton weight. I go to see a friend. Hello, I'm Monsignor Patrick Winslow. And I am Father Matthew Cowth. And we are speaking from the rooftop. A podcast brought to you by Tan Books, in which we invite you to join our conversation out here in the open air where we look out upon the world around us from the rooftop of the church and share with you what we see. Makes me wanna scream from the rooftop to the screen. Greetings. Well, hello. And happy feast day. I thought we should probably speak speak at least a little bit, begin uh, who's by talking about the feast day today. Uh, wait, wait, is this a lesser known saying? Today is one of the great feasts of the church, mm. and hopefully you're celebrating it with, with due mm. pomp and circumstance, and hopefully those who bear this name will receive the sort of gifts that they should be afforded, because today is the feast of St. Matthew. And as that is, of it's course, all about you, my Father. First name. It's, all, it's always all and about the you. name Matthew. Of course, means gift of God. So one can give a gift, but it just isn't always necessarily appreciated for its actual value and worth. So I'll just give you the opportunity to to make sure that you're. Well, I do see the connections. I I see uh, an admitted sinner, mm. diminutive stature. <laughs> That's the <a> kiss. <laughs> Never says that about Matthew. Well, <laughs> in my mind. <laughs> Let's see. Oh. Um, but you know what I Resented of? by the others because... Yes, that's true. You know, well, resented insofar as at first, jealousy comes at first, in. Yeah, yeah, the jealousy comes in. That, I, oh, I can see totally why, unfounded. I can see why you're picking that up. Totally unfounded um, jealousy. But I did think to myself this morning when I was praying that the unbelievable lack of information we have about the 12 most important men ever chosen by Jesus. I mean, Mm. the fact that we can speculate, really, where he died, where he was, um, if he was the one to write the gospel, if he was the one that that wrote in Hebrew, or did he write it in Greek, or all the various things that, that swirl around. He's just one of the apostles. Yeah. And he's one that's actually more known. We have almost no knowledge of any of the other ones. You know, obviously we Peter. It's very James, limited. You know, there was John. A, um an Anglic I believe he was an Anglican priest, but he's very Anglo Catholic in many ways. He wrote um I think one of the best books on Padre Pio. Uh, oh, we call it, Ruffin, Ruffin, R-U-F-F-I-N. yeah. He also wrote a book on the Twelve. And mm. he wanted to assemble what are the things that we believe we know that with some measure of certainty mm. about the Twelve. And it's a very small book because there isn't a ton. There, you know, mm-hmm. It is, as you say, scarce. Uh, but there are some things that we, we believe that we know. Right. Uh, it, it, it has come down to us through the ages that has some veracity or outside outside verifiable first-hand sources and things mm-hmm. of that nature. So it, it, it's a good, it's a good, it's not like a, you know, an, an exciting read, mm-hmm. but it's a good read in the sense that this is a good resource. Somebody did the work for you right. to right. kind of pin down what we think we know. And there's a ton of confusion people don't really think about when it comes to certain names being used in the gospel. When you talk about, you know, this Mary and that Mary and which right. one is this. And it matters because... Uh, some of them are cousins of Jesus and mm. are these, you know, is, is a Mary related by marriage into the family of the Virgin, you know, on the St. Joseph side, on the Mary side. And so when you're trying to put all these relations together, because you're trying to say this apostle right. comes from this family, there are, we know that there are some type of relations to the family of Christ, whether it's through the Joseph side or whether it's through the Virgin Mary side. And you're trying to pin them down. Right. And so you have to start getting their relations in order. And it's tricky. It is tricky. And then you've got the fact that they have oftentimes two names, right? One right. that would mm-hmm. be the classic Hebrew name, one that was a, a Greek name. And then you have the difficulty of the fact that Our Lady's name was one of the most common, as was Our Lord's. Right. Right. And the fact that he even used for himself and his own mother names that were well known. Right. Actually, the Italians have a funny uh, 
they don't say find a needle in a haystack. Uh-huh. They say trovare una Maria per Roma, Roma. Find a Mary um, in f- f- Try to find a specific Mary, Mary in, in Rome, Rome is impossible because right. they're all named Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Maria. <laughs> but that that sort of obscurity, on the one hand, they're they're very well known um, by anyone who would have been around at the time and following Christ. They're the ones that got selected. And then they they fall into sort of this utter sort of obscurity. And yet we hold that the particular churches, the apostolic traditions that we have, came from where they went and what they did. From the twelve. Right. Yeah. With Matthias replacing Judas, yeah. Yeah. Well, I found interesting in in reading the prayers of the Divine Office this morning, in particular um, uh, morning prayer, were the antiphons for the common of apostles. Mm. In the two the first two antiphons they speak of love. Right. And the third antiphon refers to friendship. Mm-hmm. Now, when you when someone says the apostles, are those the words you think of? Well, love and friendship. I, you might. Only because, because you, wrote a, you wrote a thesis. When I wrote a thesis on that, I noticed those antiphons. Did you? And it struck me quite acutely that this is how they're referring to the apostles. Because we think about them as the authorities. Right. But Christ is the one who called them friends. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it and of course, the, the, the ending of John's gospel with Peter and Peter, do you love me? And that's how he thought of them. Yeah. And not that they chose him, but he chose them. No, it's it's true. I'm actually going to find And the yet in the antiphons. choosing, in the choosing of them, I was thinking this morning about Paul's, um, St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians when he says, I think that we apostles have been placed last in line by Christ. I I Mm -hmm. never noticed that before. But he's he's looking at his life saying, I think we're placed last in line. And then he goes on to say, we're sort of these, um, in the arena, we're the the scum and the refuse of all. Is that the same where he starts starts talking about the, no, that's in a different passage. He talks about about being a fool for Christ. Yeah, I I don't recall. But I mean, he does, he does have that view um, that were the last of all. The last of all. And yet they're the ones that are going to be on 12 thrones. We're going to, we, we are going to know who they are. <laughs> well, that's right. Uh, you're not going to be able to... Yeah, so here's, here, here's the first antiphon from morning prayer for the common of apostles. My commandment is this, love one another as I have loved you. And then the second antiphon is, there is no greater love than to lay down your mm-hmm. life for your friends. Which is the central point of the thesis that I Which have. transitions love to friendship. And mm-hmm. then the third antiphon is, you are my friends, says the Lord, if you do what I command you. Which is the thing I always, always tell you. You are my friend if you do what I command you. Yes, you do say that a lot. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not going to deny that. Um, that is a common theme if you're going to have any sort of friendship with oh. him. That he demands total obedience. So I was noticing when I was waiting for you to finish up a meeting, and I was in the chapel, mm. um, not only was your breviary in there, which I availed myself of, mm. but you had something sitting there next to it that surprised me. <laughs> yes, you can't hide it now. No. He had the Summa, the St. Thomas's Summa Theologia in there. Yeah. Now, I noticed that the bookmark was still like on the first question. But nevertheless, you must have cracked that book. Well, I mean, the bookmark is there because it's like fudge. Mm. It takes a lot to digest. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would have to freely admit. I've been intrigued in this past year more with St. Thomas as a, clair- a clarifier of my thinking mm-hmm. um, than ever before, than ever I had to study him in class or even for that matter in some of our conversations of the past. There's been um, a desire, some desire with respect to it's almost it's almost as though my mind is now ready for certain distinctions and categories mm. um whereas I couldn't really put them there before until I was queued up, so I'm really late to the game after fifty years mm. but it's it's as though it's ready for certain things, certain foundational things interesting which as you know, I'm familiar with the concepts and familiar with many course, things, so it's not as um overwhelming. That said, I also know that uh, although he meant it as a catechesis for all, that uh, scholars have been trying to wrap their minds around his material 
you know, for the ages here. So I know that it's not, um, you know, something that you just read and say, oh, I got it. But no. at the same time, uh, I think a lot is accessible and even, you know, having a lot of uh, exposure in the past. Absolutely. But yes, I can't even joke about it because my um, <laughs> I, 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 I'm too reverent toward his content at the moment. <laughs> well, I was I was noting it too because I had a very good conversation yesterday with a young man who is discerning a possibility of entering the seminary, and one of the things he was discussing was that his spiritual director told him he's not allowed to just sort of read Saint Thomas front to mm. back. He says you're not you're not ready for that yet, oh. um, and nor would he be able to necessarily grasp the concepts. Right. Like any lexicon, it's difficult right. figuring out what Thomas means by these words. But beyond that, he was saying that uh, he's he did begin to read it, and he said it's had an untold wonderful effect on his mind. Not because he's just now grasped all sorts of new concepts, but because he feels like it's a a wash every time he reads it. Mm-hmm. Like his brain gets washed and, and things get put away and put in the right order. I think it's a helpful thing for people if they're going to start reading it to start where the rubber meets the road for most people, which is in the second part. Because the first part's very metaphysical. It's very dense, very difficult about God and it's wonderful. But I do think that the second part, which is about man um, and man's relation to God coming forth from God, might be the most helpful for most people simply because it talks, it's the largest treatise ever written on the emotional life, basically, hmm. on the passions, as Thomas called them. Because it's something that we all suffer, which is why he called them passions. That these are modifications that happen to us when we wake up in the morning. And every object that we see is something that we're attracted to or have an aversion to. And then every single emotion kind of falls out from that. And he really consider them as bodily modifications based upon an apparent um, good or evil that we that we perceive. Mm. And I guess when I first started to read that section, I, I, I like so many things in the faith, I thought to myself, why did anyone ever tell me this? I mean, I, don't, I didn't know what was going on inside of me, but this makes perfect <laughs> sense. <laughs> it reminds me, of, what's that phrase? Uh, what do you do with good advice? You pass it along so it doesn't get wasted. So it doesn't get wasted. Right, mm. meaning nobody accepts it. Yeah, right? um, that's true. It's in you know much the same way we we have access and resource uh, oh to so many different resources uh, so many uh, spiritual and intellectual mm. uh, gems but you know it, it really kind of comes down to are you ready uh, are you willing yeah do you want yeah uh, you know it, it's reminiscent of Jesus asking the, the paralytic do you want to be healed do I have no one to, to yeah, I have no one that can put me in the water but do you do want, you to, want be to be healed? Mm. You know, it's it's not that he can't heal him. It's just you have to be ready. You have to be disposed. You have to, you know, you, you have to. And of course, he says he does. And of course, he's healed. Pick up your mat and go. Do you think that he wanted to be healed? I think that's why our Lord asked the question. I mean, on some level, that's his livelihood. That's his life now. Mm-hmm. You get we get so so habituated to our situation and can use our situation, whatever the suffering is, as something that is uniquely ours, that we, in some sense, don't even want to get rid of the burden right. of whatever it is. Because it seems impossible that he couldn't get into that water. <laughs> well, the other thing is our identities can be wrapped around things, even That's bad it. things, and we don't know who we are apart from them. Um, so we have a... a we can have an undue reliance, even on, on bad things. But I think in that case, my my gut says, and I realize we're in the realm of speculation. Sure. Um, I, you know, my, my gut says that even if at that point he never really wanted to be healed, but maybe was, it's which is hard to imagine, right? Somebody who's sure. in that position of paralytic, yeah. not wanting to be healed. But um, that he certainly had the desire at the time in which he was healed, whether it was precipitated by that conversation or not. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think, uh, you know, my gut says he always did want to be healed. I do understand how you can get to a point where um, you start to identify with certain parts of yourself, even broken parts of yourself, yeah. so that you can't imagine being yourself apart from that. Yeah. And it really start to wonder... Uh, which is a, which is different. I mean, obviously, it's 
it, it can be not just a physical condition or situation, but it can be something else. Yeah, we spoke that one time about on one of these podcasts about growing older and how difficult it is um, to let certain activities that have sort of defined you or shaped you or that you enjoy doing to let them go mm-hmm. because you feel as if you're letting yourself go. And in the, in the point about receptivity, that's... Well, you are letting yourself go, but that's aside the point. I don't have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a choice. Someone's taking it from me every single day, it seems like. Um, but back to that point about receptivity, that's one of those great great lines of the medievals. They had so many little phrases by which they would memorize things and they'd make them rhyme or have alliteration or something because they had to memorize everything. You'd have lots of paper and books lying around yeah. you could take with you and certainly no internet. And so they had that principle that you've you no doubt learned when you studied philosophy that quid quid recipitur ad modem recipientis recipitur which is, it's got that lyrical sound to it but it just means that that which is received is received in the mode of the receiver so that I have to, for example, on a podcast here, if we want to communicate to the people that are listening, it doesn't do any good to speak Latin necessarily, which is what we just I just did. <laughs> you have to give them in, yeah. in the language that they can receive it in. Mm-hmm. But that's not just true of, of a particular language like English or German or Italian, but in the, any mode. Is someone, what is, what is their receptive capacity for receiving information that we have, from receiving us, sure. from receiving the gospel, etc.? Sure. And that's different for every person. Yeah, without doubt. And <clears throat> and there are s- subjective dispositions that play a part of it. You know, just because God has revealed does not mean that each person is prepared to receive um, relative to their own will and intellect. Yeah. You know, they're obviously disposed to receive it. They're it's being communicated in the mother of the receiver. But their will is a part the of it. The will is huge. And huge. are you ready and or especially not? Especially when it comes to faith, because you know, faith has much to do with the will, because it's not something, it's not vision. We don't see. We have to accept it on the testimony of another. And the testimony is, is of course, God's. And so it has a certitude about it. It's, it's certain. But it's still believing someone else's mm-hmm. word. And you can't believe without an act of the will. The will is moving the intellect to adhere to something and to adhere firmly, but it it never does. It never comes without an act of the will. No. Do you think when the apostles just going back to the the feast day today? Of course, I haven't really gotten. Of course, I haven't. I haven't uh, exhausted that topic. No, obviously. clearly not. Um, do you think that uh, when the apostles went out? Imagine, I mean, they they had this kind of intuitive infusion. The church teaches of of the fullness of the faith. And yet, not knowing necessarily, except by supernatural grace um, and supernatural prudence and counsel, what to do. So when our Lord ascends, and then the Pentecost happens, and they go out, imagine Matthew, maybe he's got someone else with him, maybe he's in Ethiopia, the, sort of the tradition has it. Um, where does one begin? Mm. Could you imagine going out with this information? Someone has risen from the dead, and he's God. And God has yeah. a son. Um, and then you you walk into a foreign land. The language likely you do not speak, even though certainly the language of commerce would have been there relative for, for Greek, Latin, etc. So they, they could have communicated. But where do you begin? You know, it's a great question. And it kind of it's coming full circle. It's coming back to the antiphons, I think. Um, you begin with, with love and friendship. Mm. Uh you know, you if if I'm going to communicate to a people for which I am foreign and a, a culture, a language, um, personal relationships, background history, not known from any other person in the you know any other foreigner coming into the group, uh, how how do I bridge those relations in such a way that they would be willing and receptive? Mm. To hear something so extraordinary uh, and that requires such an ascent of authority with respect to the divinity of Christ and receiving faith. And it seems to me love and friendship are the, are the, is the start. And it makes sense because that's how Christ started with them. Yeah, He took them on 
his friends and he let them know that this was much higher than being a a disciple um that this was a partic- that this was a friendship mm. and that and that he was loving them and in that sense it really is the pattern of evangelizing evangelizing that is bringing the evangelio the, the, the evangelium sorry spanish to, to latin the evangelium the, the bringing the gospel to people well you start there yeah and you know using that word as as all of our listeners i'm sure know um that greek word which we use the word um evangelical or something of that nature the the gospel the word gospel in greek is it begins with an eu or an epsilon upsilon which is in greek is a it means something is good or the best or the highest it's just like the eucharist um it's the, the highest grace or the highest gift etc even though the verbal form means thanksgiving and why is it good news i suppose if you're walking into a new town and pursuant to the antiphons pursuant to what you're mentioning to be able to reveal to people that I don't know what sort of god you were worshiping because they were mm-hmm. all worshiping that's one they had in their favor is that everyone believed they were disposed toward dis- yeah disposed toward divinity the supernatural and, and such good news to realize that I know that you thought he was requiring of you this sacrifice mm-hmm. but he's not can you imagine what incredible relief that would be to mm-hmm. realize that god is love right <laughs> that I don't actually have to sacrifice my goat my kid um that's kind of a joke I guess right, my right, actual okay, child okay, yeah. um or do some sort of strange thing but he has come to save me and and assumed my lowly state to save me what a what a transformative thing that would be if you were already believing in god and then you came to find out who the real one was mm. whereas you, now it's for the opposite i mean everyone buys that he's love but 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 the nature of love has been so evacuated of all content and purpose um and meaning well there i mean i have two thoughts let's see if i can remember both of them sorry so the, that's right now the first one um is the the origin of the term uh evangelium in in the latin context in that context an event in an evangelium this good news was an edict of the roman emperor mm-hmm. and as an edict of the roman emperor because it was assumed in the culture that anything the emperor did was good <laughs> then what was communicated was good for everyone mm-hmm. uh and that's where you get this uh this notion of uh, the 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 secular notion of an evangelium the yeah. this gospel right. and then it is incorporated or rather taken up in apostolic times in use in those terms but you, which does attribute to Christ this divine royalty mm-hmm. uh from whom is emanating this genuinely good news yeah. because it's coming from he who is the source of all good the actual king uh yeah so it really sort of lays a it's a nice secular um um etymological background mm-hmm. for the supernatural reality that it is so there is that uh The other thing is I in terms of coming into a town and saying counting the cost I remember I think I talked to you about this before uh maybe even in one of these oh, I'm sure I've talked about it before but maybe even in one of these recorded rooftop sessions but um there was uh, there was a time and I was watching uh a documentary on on um the camel jockeys Mm-hmm. I, may, I may have mentioned it again mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. previously but the, the whole idea was is I'm watching it I realize it really is a documentary on human trafficking and that these children are being used in that manner uh and they were being taken and bought, purchased you know from their parents who were faced with the untenable position of having to let the whole family die or sell one kid to feed the right. others right. Right. you know it was just utterly horrible and I remember thinking this place needs to hear the gospel you need to bring the the good news of the gospel and they're going to receive it and at the time it was early on in my priesthood my experience with the people in our culture in our affluent world uh even our middle class is affluent compared to the majority of the world um the first question they tend to ask when you come in with a message of the gospel is what is it going to cost me what do i have to give up yeah whereas someone in this other situation where they're facing this horrible position mm. of of just keeping their children alive and possibly having to sell one for the sake of the others 
the gospel comes in is just nothing but light. They're not going to ask about contraception. They're not going to ask about the demands of chastity. They're, they're not going to ask about um, you know holy days of obligation. Uh, they're not going to. They're not going to ask about. Do I really need to go to confession? They're not, they're not can asking. I, can I eat meat on Friday? Are you kidding? <laughs> exactly. All they're asking. All they all they would see yeah. is light. Yeah. Light in darkness, and yet you can see what Mother Teresa would call the poverty of affluence. Mm-hmm. We become so impoverished that the gospel is perceived in the first instance is a set of demands. Yeah, just paying some dues. Yeah. Uh, what what can I can what can I and what I can and cannot do, and it's a restriction, um, rather than received as goodness, mm-hmm. and that is really I think one of the great perversions of of, a, of the of the affluence in which we currently live. You know, I remember it was reading uh, Carl was it Carlos Serra, who was talking about. Um, we have to be very careful about speaking about poverty um, because we do have religious communities that take vows of poverty. And by that fact, we are actually saying that there's something good uh, to this. That's a good point. Right? And so he's talking about the evangelical councils, which is to say the the councils not as in like group meeting of people, but counsel is in like advice or guidance right. and following the pattern of Christ, poverty, chastity, and obedience. Like he lived that, 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 that way. And therefore others who've come to follow in closer right. to his likeness, establish these religious communities where they f- take vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. So he was saying, we need to really talk about the type of poverty that we're trying to eradicate in society is it is really what we call destitution. He said, you know, that, it, it's we're, we we need to fight that, but people relinquishing themselves of a, f- a fair amount of affluence and wealth um, for the benefit of others or for the straight up benefit of themselves is not bad. In fact, we say in religious life that's a good thing right. because they're unencumbered, and the gospel is not ever really met with what is it going to cost me. Yeah. Uh, it's seen as just nothing but when you pure pay it goodness. up front, it doesn't matter <laughs> that yeah. you're just receiving. The you benefits. invest in, exactly. You're, you're all in, right? Yeah. Um, anyway, I know that was a kind of a, a, a lot. No, no. It's, but it's, it's an important distinction. I mean, we can't talk about poverty in religious life and say that that's a good that they do embrace, and then turn around and talk about eradicating poverty. That's so a really a good. Distinction. That's a really good distinction that I don't think I've, I've I read or have considered before, and because you think about it in terms of. The sometimes if if you encounter someone who is who is who is poor, for example, or is asking you for help or assistance, and and you don't necessarily find them to be persons of of great charity necessarily, right? Mm-hmm. Um, at, at the same time, I think one of your lines, which I, I think is true, is that when you ha- you have a lot of scams, obviously that go on, yeah, um, relative to the to the persons that present themselves as poor. Um, but when they actually are poor, you almost always experience them as humble. Yes. Because life has humbled them. Um, they're almost ashamed to ask. Right. And yet in Rome, it was interesting living there because there, there are some who just choose to live that way for, for lack of a better um, explanation. I mean, they, that's what they would say. It's like, I want to live here this way. I want to be uh, on the streets, it's a job. as it were, almost as a job. Mm-hmm. Um, but then they would get caustic with anyone that didn't didn't uh, Pay assist up. them. Yeah, um, and you were you really you were caustic every time you went by. Yeah. and so I, I had lots of opportunities to speak with some of these people over great lengths of time mm-hmm. living there, and it, it was sort of really fascinating to, to listen to their story and what it. Did. So, in other words, it doesn't do the job itself just being poor. Right? There has to be that that sort of volitional aspect to it even then. To be unencumbered. You or... can be resentful of being poor. <laughs> you can be, sure. You can be angry. You can be hopeless. Um, you can be unencumbered. And then that will to say, I want to, the old medieval axiom was, follow naked the naked Christ. Right. Um, I, I want to be unencumbered. I want to be free um, to be able to serve him. But, you know, I, I th- yeah, I think of... Um... I think of the shackles that's, that so many of our desires put us in, 
and certainly uh, comforts and mm. many and they're tempting. I mean, there's not too few priests that really like cars, sure. or there's not too few priests that you know that really like this or that. I mean, we're, we're sure. in this a secular priest. We're all in the same boat here, yeah. so we under we totally get it, right? Um, we we totally understand. But and they, can, we use the excuse we did not take a vow of poverty, right? Exactly. <laughs> Which Mother Teresa tried to warn, uh, you know, uh, diocesan priests about, yeah. and be very, very careful there, just because she was trying to help priests yeah. not be encumbered, right. uh, and, and 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 therefore lose the type of freedom that they really ought to have. So it's there is a difference again. Destitution is something we should all be fighting against. Uh, people people dying, people suffering because they go without, um, you know imbalances that social imbalances that lead to destitution this is just not tenable it's not proper it's not not proper on a natural level and it's definitely not proper on a supernatural level that said there is a lane of of a chosen simplicity poverty uh, of unencumbrance that christ lived i think it would be interesting to talk maybe at a different podcast about about the vows, since yeah. persons that would necessarily listen to a podcast or from the rooftop kind of a thing, um, oftentimes you know are families and married couples, and or widows, widowers, etc. Um, and yet the vows do the even evangelical councils do um, permeate Christian existence, and they're not simply reserved for those who are particularly in the religious uh, life. That is to say, the was considered classically the life of perfection. In other words, I, I do this because I want to imitate Christ to in every possible way. Mm-hmm. And yet everyone has to on some level. So right. um that might be a good idea to to use it as a future as a future topic. Certainly. Um, and I, I would just also throw out there as a potential future topic, but of course, what are the chances of you and I remembering? <laughs> um, None. But <laughs> but that for people who find themselves not desiring, but find themselves in financial situations where it's hard to make ends meet, where you feel some constraints of impoverishment, that they would be able to use that yes. for spiritual benefit and good is a wealth yeah. that others don't have. And that goes into that larger topic and theme uh, that actually I had in the back of my mind of kind of bringing up for a conversation, but um, you really took it into the whole St. Matthew direction, mm. which I'm about to loop it all back around. By I, the way. I, I'm about- um, the, the, um, this general idea that people have, oh, all right, I'm now going to respond to my faith. I now have to, you know, I'm, I'm queued up. I'm, I'm ready. I, I really want to be more devout in my life. And they look for these outside efforts. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll get involved with this. I'll get involved with that. I'll get involved. Nothing wrong with all that. That's, that can be great. Right. But lit- Modes of service. Everything you need is right in front of you. Yeah. Everything. All of that straw, like Rumpelstiltskin, you can turn to gold. It is the substance of your life. Every relationship, broken not unbroken, dysfunctional, not dysfunctional. Um, every permutation of your heart, um, every mood of sadness and inclination towards mm-hmm. selfishness and mm-hmm. self-absorption, the resentments that build up because of our our. You should have broken, seen the way he looked at me when he said that. Gosh, are broken it's really deep in him and uh, uh, profoundly misunderstood concepts of justice and particularly justice applied to situations where we don't even really have all the information. I mean, all mm-hmm. of that, all of that yeah. is where you're meant to sow That's right. the seeds of the gospel. And we bypass it to go to this thing or that right. thing at church. And it's all of those things that you're bypassing ought to be directing you back to that very stuff. Right. And it's sitting there right there. That's where it all happens. Um, it's 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 one of the reasons why you and I have said over the arc of time that the church is really built up in profound ways through the confessional, mm. uh, because 
It's people looking at that stuff and helping them harness their love of God and love of neighbor and sense of own vocation, helping them deal with that harder stuff where the bigger things happen or they lead to larger consequences uh, and effect in the life. And that leads to greater light in the world right? right. Uh, and less darkness. Uh, and so I, I think you would agree with me and you know, having chatted over the course of years that that's where the real stuff happens. Um, it's, again, go ahead, do the Bible studies, do the, catech- the catechetical stuff, get involved, do all these sorts of things. Methods of service. But absolutely. you can't do that in lieu of. You can't escape the interior life. There's a primacy to that stuff in the interior absolutely. life. Absolutely. That you have to... That you have to work with. That's your real fodder for sanctity. That's where you turn strong. Which is why we don't want to work there. (laughs) It's harder. It's a lot harder. It's a lot harder. It's a lot harder to evangelize your world than it is to evangelize everyone else's. And in some level, that's that's the reason that the religious take these vows, right? Is that you don't you can't run away from it. You can't run away from it into into some sort of consumerism. You can't run away from it by doing whatever your your capricious will wants to Mm. do at the the moment because you have to be obedient. Um, and then, of course, you can't run away with it, uh, away from it, in the incredible vicissitudes of of relationships, because you're taking about chastity. Yeah. Right? So you're not focused on just someone else's problems or your relationship with them, etc. No, I am naked before God, right. and I have to look at this thing. That being said, um, obviously, that's the state of perfection. It's not perfection. So the person who's in religious life. Um, has to still engage it. In some level, it sets up the the mechanism by which they have to engage the very fodder you're speaking about. At the same time, it's it's interesting listening to um, confessions of religious, you know, over the years and things. I'm sure you have too. Um, and what the what the what they struggle with in the beginning. Um, I remember one one wonderful missionary charity told me he said. Father, we take a vow of poverty and another vow to serve, the, always be available to serve the poorest of the poor. But we're all really greedy about getting the first water uh, to wash with. Right. We're all ex- exceptionally um, avaricious over which blue sweater we're going to wear. Right. Because we're going to be ourselves in there. It's just that it, it makes us deal with it. Right. Um, right. Which I thought was really beautiful and humble of her to say. <laughs> Absolutely. But even those people have... I mean, like say vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, or those people who make commitments to celebrate things, they do, as you say, they do become, uh, you know, naked and vulnerable, mm-hmm. so to speak, to to those in that community, to to the friendships that they have, where they have the ability to see reflected in in those others themselves as they are. Um, kind of exposed and with all the parts that we don't really want to see. Yeah. Uh, and and they, they serve that. They really do serve that purpose. And, you know, I would say that, you know, you and I over the arc of time, you know, we've served, uh, you know, in our best possible, you know, in, in all of our best efforts to help see, uh, you know, each other, to be able to help, help us see ourselves as we really are, yeah. um, and there is a vulnerability, and boy, that vulnerability hurt. It just, it's humiliating. Uh, it's hard. It requires trust, uh, especially you know, evoking the help of another, and confidence. Uh, people get this instantaneously with the sacrament of co- the confessional. Right. They get that confidentiality. They don't always get you know, the wisest priest to be able to deal with the most complex situations, but they do get all those things instantaneously and sacramentally uh, that grace is going to operate and work through. Mm. But relative to, like I say, the stuff that's there for your life to work through, even those mirrors of other people, those vulnerable relationships that force us to reckon with things, they're all there. I, I, I guess I could sort of close out this discussion from my part by saying that when you were speaking, it, it struck me that both in religious life as well as in just normal, everyday human family life, um, you meet those characters that have refused for so long to see themselves. And the penalty for that, almost like a contrapasso of Dante's hell, the, 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 um, the penalty for that is they no longer see, period. Mm. You know, the petrified persons mm-hmm. that get stuck 
in a mode and they will just live that out the rest of their life. Whereas what you're speaking about is that sort of that that interior youthfulness and organic growth that I am not done. I must see. Um, so back to the the healing of our blessed Lord. It's like that the blind man when he asks him, what would you have me do for you? And he just says, Utvideam, that I might see. That's a really good prayer right. you know, in terms of self-knowledge. Um, what is the fodder that I have to work on now? And where, Lord, are you leading me? So, yeah. um, well, you know, and as you, I think you had said at some point in the past about the Dominican approach toward spiritual direction, that it really is in the context of friendships, uh, you know, where everyone's kind of running around. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think that this is um, coming from you. And, you know, rather than everyone running around saying, I need to find a spiritual director. Right. Well, first of all, there are not enough priests in the world to provide particular spiritual direction for everybody. I mean, we do this primarily through uh, our parochial life, right. confessions and exactly. homilies and, and the occasional need where you have to meet with a priest. But um, but the friendship, um, an informed, faithful friendship, I mean, uh, so much of the interior life is built through that type of work. The, the, the Having these friendships that are predicated on these spiritual foundations, mm. um, this is where so much work is done. Uh, in 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 this in this spiritual direction, spiritual life, and then as I as I mentioned, I bring it all the way back around to St. Matthew and come full circle. And I think um, is is that we ask the question, why would this group uh, foreign to this apostle um, receive this man? And we mentioned the antiphons, love and friendship, but we kind of fell into the poverty um, because he lived differently. Yes. He was yes. unencumbered. He he wasn't doing what everyone else was doing. Be- right. You know, we Why are you that. happy yeah. and you have nothing? Yeah. Why are you pursuing nothing that Where we're pursuing? Where are your riches? Yeah. And why did you come from a far off country to speak to us? Right. Like, why? <laughs> and, yeah, we're, we're, and of course, then the, the greatest of, of poverty is of not just losing your money, but losing your body. Like the, the right. martyrdom, the witness of martyrdom with these guys. Yeah, the good, it's of, of friendship, of love, yeah, and a, and a, and a Great total love poverty. Great no man to lay down his life, right? Yeah, there you go. Well, we, we, wow, it's almost we like we planned circle. that. So I think we went longer today because you were too busy last week to meet to do a podcast. So, <laughs> oh. it's but been a busy. One. At least you came to my office this time. I so did. It made I it a little did. easier for me. We're on the we're on the Chancery rooftop. Um, yes, that's true. but I should say Looking I should out. say a little shout out. So before we go, yeah. In fact, this is my before we go too. I think oh, this we, we need to do this jointly. Go. Okay. Well, from my vantage point, before we go, I want to give a shout out to some a couple that just was a delight to meet. They came to the seminary, and it was it happened. I won't give their names, but it happened because um, she had written to me an email saying that uh, how how um, how inspiring or hope filled. She found various talks that we've given to be and listening to me assisted them, and she suffered you. I think I, well, that's the th- the funny thing was she, she said out, that she would it's, listen it's just to me. It's ironic that she between... reached out to me and not to you, um, but that's fine. Um, um, let me um, just say because my point of gratitude <laughs> is that she brought me a gift basket. She of did candy. because she listens very astutely to what is being said yep. in these talks. And she brought Father Winslow a big basket of Halloween candy. Fantastic. <laughs> I am <laughs> thrilled. And she sewed us some uh, some wool sort of mittens. They're really, they're really quite cool. Um, because in case we're on the rooftop and it gets cold, that was our very hands sweet. will stay warm. It's very sweet. I've tried them on. And, they're quite and she nice. sort of um, laced them with a little bit of silver lining, as we say. Like, there's always a no, we lining. honestly, thank you so much. That was really sweet and precious. Those little signs of affection and... They, they warm the heart more than the hands. Amen. So, Amen. Uh, and the candy is leading me to the dentist this afternoon. <laughs> uh, in truth. In so, truth. I, won't, I will not be reporting on how that appointment goes. Let's just say my dentist sees me a lot. Uh, but that's part, of my, that's part of the lawsuit. I'm having a class action lawsuit against my father for genetic betrayal. <laughs> so, like, you know, I, get, I, get, I easily get genetic cavities. Genetic betrayal. Yep. <laughs> I mean, the only difference he is... He seems to be doing just fine. Yeah, oh, he's He can fine. give you a, oh, yeah. a very good inheritance. Oh, let me tell you. First of all, I look too much like him. Mm. That is a betrayal. But uh, I, I, it's, it's a class action because I'm, I'm, I'm enjoining my, my, my siblings. 
and as they get older and they're facing this, you know, same medical, you know, similar medical problems and whatever, um, it's really kind of all pointing to he him. He is to blame. He, he is, is to, to blame. blame. So uh, the only difference is we just, you know, what you'd say, what, 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 what is the benefit of suing him now? Is to get his money while he's alive and watch him, <laughs> watch us use it as opposed to getting it when he's he driving him crazy. Him. Absolutely. Oh, he's a wonderful man. Well, uh, God bless you all. Great yes. to be with you. And thank you so much for those gifts. That was really sweet. Thank you. Bye-bye. It makes me wanna scream From the rooftop to the screen Thanks for listening to this episode of From the Rooftop. For updates about new episodes, special guests, and exclusive deals for From the Rooftop listeners, sign up at rooftoppodcast.com. Com. And remember, for more great ways to deepen your faith, check out all the spiritual resources available at tanbooks.com. And we'll see you again next time from the rooftop. Anywhere.